Oh, my prospects just have fear. They just have a lot of fear. Well, no shit, Sherlock. But it's your <laughs> job as the sales professional to help them overcome that fear. That's why you get paid a lot of money. That's your job to help them overcome the fear. This is the Full Stack Sales Pro. What up, Full Stack crew? I hope you guys are all well and that you are just ready to get your world rocked, honestly, by one of the best in the whole entire sales space to do it. Uh, today, we have an absolute legend on our show. Uh, you've probably seen him featured in Forbes, Wall Street Journal, USA Today Network. I mean, hell, the list goes on. He's probably been featured in Salsa Dancing Magazines because he's just a legend at that level. But uh, we have the one and only on the Full Stack podcast here today for you to have a front row seat to, to Jeremy Miner, okay? Jeremy, I, again, I, I've said this off camera, but I'll say it again. I am grateful for you. Um, you've been doing amazing things in this community and in this space. And for our listeners to have the opportunity to just learn from you, thank you. Thank you for taking the time out of probably what is a very hectic but successful business uh, schedule. Thank you for giving us all your tips, tricks, and what your secret sauce actually is today. And uh, so yeah. thank you. Well, Welcome. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me on your show. You know, I had uh, I think I was I had Taylor on my podcast, I think right when the pandemic hit. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, OK, what am I going to do? All my speaking engagements got canceled for the next year. So yeah. well, let's start a podcast. And I had Taylor on there. So I really enjoy your community and what you guys are are doing. So it's, it's an honor to be on your show for sure. Awesome. Heck, yeah. Well, let's just kind of dive into it. And I, I want to start here. I would love for you to kind of give your backstory because we see a lot of people come in and they're just like they they're leaving one industry and then they just find sales. I mean, even including myself, we won't go into that, but I would love to know, like, how did you get started in the, in the lane? Yeah. So I, you know, I, um, here's what I'll do. This might help. So I got into sales and I can share a little bit of my background. Cause I, I think my background, uh, really relates to what is necessary. If a sales professional wants to take their income from wherever they're at to you know, here, if you guys are watching my hand signal. So yeah. I got into sales about 20 years ago, I think my junior year in college. I was, I was a broke, burned out kid. And I got my first job selling home security systems door to door. Okay. If anybody on here has ever done door to door, that was me. I was like a 21 to 22 year old kid. And, and the company, to make a long story short, the company basically gave us a script, gave us a couple of books to read from the gurus at the time <laughs> and basically drove us out in a van if you can everybody visualize that dropped us off in a neighborhood a not so safe neighborhood and basically said hey go make some sales we'll pick you up after dark all right <laughs> oh and i i mean I, you know, if you've been in door to door you guys know what i'm talking about but i really thought selling was going to be easy because that's what everybody told me in the office so my sales manager is like, hey, you got to go out there and be really excited when they open the door and, and you know, jump into your pitch and tell them all the great things that it's going to do for them and how much it was going to help for them. But I started noticing from the very first door that I was getting a lot of objections within like in the first 10, 15, even 30 seconds. Like, oh, we don't need it. Uh, we already have somebody for that. Uh, oh, no, we can't afford that. Uh, oh, the price is too high. Somebody came around last year. Uh, I need to talk to my spouse. I need to think it over. Can you call me back a week, a month, a year later? Right? Does anybody ever get those objections? Wait, wait. So, so you actually had objections. Like, like that's not I, just well, us. <laughs> I got slapped in the face really, really fast, right? You, you wow. think you have a plan until the, you know, the plan, what, what does Tyson say until they just punch you in the nose? I mean, that's basically <laughs> yeah. what happened. And I remember going through all of that rejection for the first, I'd say seven or eight weeks and, and mm. barely making any sales. No straight commission. You don't make a sale, you make zero dollars. Mm. So basically my friends who stayed back in college who were working at like, let's say, McDonald's for mm. minimum wage were making more than I was. Okay. Mm. So I remember, I remember standing, I remember one, one night into this, like maybe a couple months into, it, I remember standing on a curb and I still remember like, you know, it's like June weather. It's like dripping the Midwest, like all hot. I'm like dying, like sweat down my back, my shirt soaked. <laughs> I, I remember I probably worked 12 hours a day and I'd made zero sales. And I remember sitting there thinking like, oh man, I'm just, I'm just a failure. Like I, and I barely got married. I had a kid on the way and I was going to have to go home and tell my wife at the time, like, Hey, um, we don't have enough money to pay rent in like three mm -hmm. weeks. We're going to have to move in with your parents. 
Like I was going to be one of those guys that had to move into the, with the in-laws and live in the basement. Yeah. And I remember that I, f- I felt like just broken a- 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 as a man. And I, I started thinking like, you know, maybe, maybe selling just wasn't for me. You know what I mean? Is you know, if, if you're listening to me, you know, on here, you might have felt that way yourself. And I remember, I remember something that that night, a very unique thing happened to me. I remember the the sales manager pulled up in the white van, and we all got in, and he plugged in a Tony Robbins CD. Twenty years ago, people were listening to CDs. In case everybody know what a CD is, and um, and Tony said something that changed everything for me. He he said, and I might be butchering it, but he said he said most people fail for the simple reason. They don't learn the right skills necessary to succeed. They don't mm. learn the right skills. Now, he went on to say that everybody is taught skills, but the people who fail are the ones who are not taught the right ones. And that was like a new concept for me. It was like a light bulb went off. It was like the heavens opened up, you know, and just like <laughs> shined down at me that maybe what the company was training me and what I was learning from what I call the old sales gurus Maybe they just weren't the right skills, right? Maybe they were just outdated and didn't work very well anymore. So I had to commit to myself that I was going to have to learn the right skills. And that's really what got me started on that journey because I didn't have a choice. And at the same time, I was in college and my major is behavioral science and human psychology. Mm. So my professors Mm. were teaching me that the most persuasive way to communicate was here. But the gurus were telling me it was here. It was like completely opposite. So I'm like, how do I take the theory from all these you know, writings and behavioral science and psychology, because it's all just theory. And how do I incorporate that into the sales process? And then that, you know, the rest is history from there, as, as they say. That's kind yeah. of my my background. Pretty boring stuff, but that's how I got started. I, I, I absolutely love it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm married and I have two kids and I have been yeah. in those moments where it's like, are we moving in? Like with one of our folks, is this, is this like, was this the peak of our greatness and now it's over and, and I'm going to have to, you know, whatever. So I, when you say that, I'm like, man, if you've never felt that, that feeling of like, Hey, this actually, this has got to work one way or another. So I I absolutely love it. When you don't have the, when you don't have the right skills, like you just don't know what you don't know. You you know, like all these people out there like, Oh, you just got to work harder, hustle, muscle. Well, yeah, you can do that. But I know tons of salespeople that work their butts off that are still broke because that none of that matters when the prospect picks up the other line or if you knock on their door or if you're on a Zoom inbound lead or outbound lead, doesn't really matter. If you don't know what to say and ask that triggers that prospect to want to engage and want to open up and go below the surface, you're still going to be broke. It doesn't matter how hard you work. Okay, you, you said something so amazing, and I'm I'm like I have all these great questions to ask you, but you're giving me so much amazing info. How did you reconcile the professor, the gurus, and then the third leg, which was actual your actual your actual experience? How did you reconcile yeah. that to yield you to success? Well, I, I took what the professors were were teaching, and, and really, and it might it might be better if I just boil it down to like. A, the simplest possible way for, for anybody listening, okay? Yeah, yeah. So according to, according to behavioral science, there are really three forms of communication, okay? And it, you know, if you're if you're listening to me and Josh right now, if you're driving, you're just gonna have to remember this if you're, if you're <laughs> at home or in the office, you know, write this down because once you understand, um, you know, what, once you understand, I would say the, the difference in persuasion of where you're at now, even if you're doing good, compared to where you could be, it will mm-hmm. completely change everything for you, all right? So the, the first mode of communication is, is called, in science terms, it's called era one, era one type of sales, all right? And, and to give it the simplest picture I could give you is think boiler room selling. Like what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of boiler room selling, all right? That's the first level of sales, right? So we're the least, pers- least persuasive, according to the behavioral science, when we tell people things, or we attempt to dominate them or posture them or push them into doing something we want them to do. Like, J- Josh, I'm sure you've seen the movie with, um, you know, Leonardo uh, right. Wolf on Wall Street, right? Yeah. And, and I'm sure Jordan Belfort, may- maybe that's just how they portray him, but he's just portrayed as like, hey, I've got a great opportunity for you. And then we talk about <laughs> the features and the, the yeah, benefits yeah. of what they, what they should do. And we push them and we tell them why they need to buy. And we've got a special promotion that they need to go with us. And it's just like if you're if you're telling your spouse that they really, really need to do something for you, and then you start pushing them to do it, what do they typically do back? Mm-hmm. 
they push back, yeah. right? It's just yeah, human yeah. behavior. You push, humans typically push back, yeah. right? So let me give you a, a few examples of the least persuasive way to sell. Presenting, all right? We're all taught that you have to give an amazing presentation. You know, you've got the, the slide decks out, you know, <laughs> that last for 10 miles. And you're talking about how great your products and services are. We've got the best this, we've got the best that, which... By the way, doesn't every single salesperson have the, say they have the best product or service there is? Like, <laughs> yeah. How many salespeople out there that have ever sold you something, Josh, is like, yeah, Josh, I mean, we're, we have the fifth best product in the market. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, okay. Nobody says that. I'm going to interject real quick because you're crushing it. But tangent, rabbit trail. Do you, as a freaking guru that you are, a legend, are you an easy sale? I would say yes. I am sure. such an easy sell. Like it yeah. could be any Instagram ad and I'm buying it. I'm like, oh yeah, that's going to change my life. It's it. I'm buying it right now. Yeah. I, <laughs> Sorry, I think, go ahead. I think, all, I think all great salespeople are because, you know, there's a saying that goes around is that you, you know, you, know, you, you, you give the objection you get. So yeah. if you're always getting the, I want to think it over objections, that's because you're typically always saying that to salespeople yourself. So it's like, a, it's like, it's not congruent, if that makes sense. So yeah. Yeah. I think the very best salespeople ever, like you and, and other people are really easy to sell because you don't look at those as like objections in your mind. Your mind thinks differently than like the average consumer, which is For sure. Good, okay. That was good. So keep going, so, keep going. Sorry. What, yeah, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll just kind of sum up this best I can, but when you say things like we have the best this, we're the best this, we've all this like typically people trust you less when you say that because they're mm -hmm. used to every single salesperson that's ever tried to sell them something saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. So they associate you with all of those negative experiences because that's what everybody tells them or especially if you talk down about your competitors. All right. Right. According to the data, it's not very persuasive if your presentation is more than 10% of your entire sales process or conversation. Whether, wow. and I think a lot of the people that you you guys train are more like one call closes or two call closes, right? Yeah, for the most more, part, More yeah. of a business to consumer, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So typically uh, that, that needs to be about 10%. The average salesperson in any in industry, it's usually about 50% that they're doing. We have to really hone that down and emotionally connect the dots. Uh, another thing, the least form of the, the least form of persuasion that you want to be in is, is telling your story. Okay. Yeah. Especially when you're selling one-to-one, -one. it's a little bit different when you're like on stage selling like one to many, that's a little bit different. We're talking more one-to-one -one sales here. Nobody cares about your story. Whose story do they most care about? Themselves. Their story, right? <laughs> what about giving a sales pitch? We've all been told we have to give a great pitch, but according to the science, not very persuasive. Like you ever, do you ever watch a uh, shark tank on like CNBC? Yeah. 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 yeah so so watch like the, the would-be entrepreneurs come out and they're really excited. They're going to come out and pitch the sharks, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I want you to watch the body language of the sharks. Watch Mr. Wonderful's face. Watch Mark Cuban. Mm -hmm. Watch Barbara and, and Kevin and, you know, Damon, John and whoever they rotate. And watch their faces when the really excited entrepreneurs come out and pitch. They're like, whoa, you know, it just it makes us cringe, right? Yeah. We have shirts for our clients now that say hashtag ditch the pitch, right? So we got to <laughs> yeah, ditch love the that. Pitch, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. What about it. the big one? Assuming the sale, according to the data, very low in the persuasion poll, especially if you're in a more of a complex scent environment that requires multiple calls and touches. Now, I'm not saying you can't assume the sale, but at certain parts of the sale, more towards the end, it just depends on what you're selling. Right. Do now, you, that's the do first you, one. Do you def are you okay if I interject on some of these things? Because you can is, interject at all. This is your show. Man. I know, I know, but this is great info, and I and I want to keep your flow going. Um, how do you differentiate between assuming the sale and temp checking? What do you mean by temp checking? I think that means different things to different people. Okay, great, great. I've seen in multiple different ways as I study sales and everyone else's thing. It's like sometimes they'll assume the sale as a temp check just to see where a you know a prospect is at and how they're feeling and so they'll call it a temp check but they're really just assuming the sale well what what i would do instead i because I, I would want to neutralize that so i wouldn't want to trigger any sales resistance so i would ask what are called checking for agreement questions oh okay. and i go through something what are your thoughts on that joan or are you with me on that mm -hmm. or do you see how that might work for you in this area so those are called more checking for agreement questions that give like you that, that help you monitor the pulse of where that conversation is going and it yeah. doesn't trigger any sales resistance. When I say assuming the sale, it's like you're getting towards the end of the conversation and you're like, 
okay, do you want to put this on Visa or MasterCard? And you haven't even asked him if they felt it, you know, do you feel like yeah. this is the answer for it? Do you feel like this is going to get you where you're wanting to go? You just come out like, you, you know, you just go through your presentation and at the end, you're like, it's going to be $9,500. All right, do you want to put it on Visa or MasterCard? Now, you'll make some sales with that because that person was already sold before you asked that silly question. Right. But for the people who are on the fence, that's just going to trigger resistance. And you're going to lose a lot of those that you could have made. It just triggers them. Okay. Yeah, so you got to yeah, be careful yeah. with that. That's what I mean by assuming the sale. Now, yeah. I'm not saying at the end of that, if I say, okay, do you feel like this could be the, the answer for you? I ask what are called a commitment question. Like, yeah, I do. Oh, okay. But hold on. Why do you feel like it is? Well, I feel like it's because of this, because of that, because of this. I mean, do you feel like this is something you can do to really get you where you're wanting to go? Oh, my, yeah, I do because of this. And then you can go into payment details and stuff right. like that. Yeah but you've already asked their permission. If you just go right into it without asking permission, it's gonna trigger resistance from the people who are still on the fence. Yeah, I, it's yeah. absolutely brilliant what you're saying. I mean, even in my experience with training salespeople, it, I mean, it's like they wanna just get there because it's so robotic for them and they don't realize, I, I told a sales team the other day, I said, have you forgotten yeah. that there's a human on the yeah. other end of that phone? Like, have yeah. you forgotten that this is not some CRM, just data line, but someone has air in their lungs, blood in their body, and they are trying to hope to God you are providing them the solution, which is a problem that they probably actually been dealing with for years. And, and I think yeah. sometimes people are just like, uh, and it's $9,800. It's like, what? What are you doing? Yeah, like you, you have to humanize the sales process. Yeah. When you humanize mm -hmm. the sales process, you're going to see that your prospects go below the surface with you and they're human back. Right. If you're just assuming the sale and going through the numbers and asking like questions like an interrogation, your prospects will only stay surface level with you. And then they'll never go below the surface where the really emotion and pain comes out. That's where the sale's made. Mm -hmm. And at the end, they're just going to say, well, I need to keep looking around or I need to yeah. think it over or mm -hmm. now's not the right time. Or, and they're going to have some objection that you're not going to be able to overcome because you were just logic, logic, asking logical based questions that never opened up the prospect. You'd be really careful of that. So second mode, I'll go through this real quick. Yeah, so I, I love it, a lot love to it. Here. Uh, second mode of communication, era two, uh, it, there's a scientific name for it, but I'm just gonna break it down is think consultative selling. So think consultative selling, second mode, okay? So we're more persuasive when we attempt to have a real discussion, all right? Consultative selling really came out in the 80s. Uh, there was several books, but one book might stand out called Spin Selling. Yeah. It, it was uh, written by a professor that never actually sold himself, but very smart guy, Neil Rackham, okay? Mm -hmm. Where he taught that you needed to ask logical-based questions to find the needs of the client, okay? Which is good. It was revolutionary in the 80s compared to boiler room selling, all right? Right, right. But what is the potential downfall when you only ask logical-based questions? Well, your prospect's going to give you logical-based answers in return, right. right? We call those surface-level questions, surface-level answers. And do prospects, do human beings make decisions based on logic or emotion? <laughs> well, my, emotion. well right. not, my wife does it pure logic, which is why I don't get half the stuff I want. But yes, emotion. <laughs> it's all emotion. I can yeah. promise you that. Yeah. She's putting on a facade. Yeah, so questions, is. questions you do not want to ask because they trigger sales resistance. They're so overused. So Sally, tell me what's uh, what's two problems that's keeping you awake at night? Never ask that question. It's <laughs> yeah. horrible. It's overused. Everybody knows what you're doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or who besides you would be involved in the decision? All right. We don't want to ask it that way. We want to we want to ask it in a way where it opens them up. Okay. Now, for, for B2C, which a lot of your people are on here, that's not really going to apply to them because it's really the husband and the wife or the husband or the wife. It's, you know, it's right. not like a decision-making process selling to companies. But if you're selling to companies, it's more like, can you walk me through your company's decision-making process when it comes to solving problems like this? Mm -hmm. Or can you walk me through your company's decision-making process? And then like, well, first of all, I'm going to have to talk with Sally at over at H&R. And then she's going to have to talk with Jim at IT because he's got to develop the software. And then you're starting to get this whole picture of who needs to be involved and who you have to pull into that decision. All right. So those are questions you just want to avoid. You don't want to say like, what sort of budget do you have set aside? Yeah, all right. Yeah, it's just yeah. a boring yeah. surface level question. All right. Where, where so do you it, go from that real quick? If you don't mind me asking, because I love that we, we're seeing that with uh, some of our, you know, B2B type clients or, you know, sales pros who are coming in. When you are gathering that data, you know, for you, where does your brain go of like, 
what your next frame is or where your what direction you'll take with them. If I ask like what can you walk me through your company's decision? Yeah, and they give process? you like let's say there's three decision makers actually, you know, legit you know, logistically involved in that. Mm -hmm. Where do you go Let from there? Let's say that you're selling some type of software that has to be installed. All right. Okay. You know that the, the chief technology officer is they might not have the ultimate say of yes or no, but are they going to influence the decision makers? Because they're going to be the ones that have to train people on it. They're going to be the ones that have to install it. So they're an influencer that can influence the actual decision makers. The average company in the United States of America, I'm not even talking Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 has 6.7 decision makers and or influencers that have to be involved, according to Forbes. It's yeah. just a regular company. Now, yeah. if you're selling to a laundromat that just has one guy that owns it, and he owns yeah. one laundromat, it's a little bit different. Okay? Right, right, right. So when they're like, oh, I need to get, uh, I'd have to talk, I'd have to go to, to legal first and I'd have to talk with Jim, our CEO, and then you know, we'd have to talk about this. Okay, would it, would it help you? Uh, and first of all, I'm like, okay, but what, what are your CEO's thoughts about you guys putting this in so that you can, and I'm going to repeat back what they said they wanted. I'm tying that in. Oh, I think he would be blah, 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 blah. And then I might say, would it help you if on the demo, let's say I'm doing a first call discovery and my sales process is I want to do a demo on the second call. Let's just say that's your process. And so maybe the third call is a proposal, fourth call is a meeting with the board. It just depends on what you're selling, all right? Right. So I might say, John, would it help you if on the demo, we had Jim and Sally over the IT department on there so that when they have questions for you about how the software works and how to implement it, you actually know, they would actually know what to do instead of you trying to rehash that yourself. Would that help you if we let them in? Okay. So it's all about getting them to say, oh yeah, that would help me. Yeah. I don't want to say, well, on the demo, I'm going to need this person on there and that person because they're decision makers. And a lot of times that person you're talking to on the first call, like a C-level executive, like, oh, no, 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 they're not decision makers. Like I'm the one that makes the ultimate decision, right, right. even though they're probably not. They're going to say that. Yeah. So I want to be more about, I want to make there's a reason why I'm having them on that demo. I might say, so would it help you since now would Jim's team, who would be responsible in actually installing the software and training it? Oh, Jim over at IT. Okay. Um, would it help you if we had Jim involved on the demo so that when he's on here, I can have my engineer, you know, Sally Fred on here because he's probably going to have questions. Would that help you to have him on here? Okay. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, that would help because I have to have a reason why they need to be on there. Not my reason, but his reason, his or her reason. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if you do it that way, they're more than likely to bring them in. If you're like, well, you know, our company policy is that we have to have the decision makers on, like that's not going to work. Does that, yeah. does that answer your question? No, I love it. I, I think what, I, you know, at least what I'm getting inspired by is the questions that you're asking or the way that you're framing or positioning it is you're actually thinking about the other person. You're, yes, it's, it's yeah. good, it's strategic and it is tactical, but it's tactical from the right motive. It's tactical from yeah. the right why. And you're just like, hey, because you're thinking, hey, you know, Jim actually is going to have to play a role in whatever it is that I do sell to you. And let's look who else has to play a role, not just decision makers, but actual buy in, because I think we all know this. It's not the sales is not done once you got that credit card. It's such a yeah. much longer process. And I see a lot of sales pros. They're just like, I got to get a card. I got to get a card. I, and it's like you missed it. You missed the whole damn thing. Like this is this is much yeah. bigger than this. So I love it. It's brilliant. It's really, top salespeople make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year or more are collaborative. They view sales oh. as collaborative. You working with the prospect to help them find and solve problems they maybe didn't even think they had. Yeah. Average salespeople and below average salespeople, broke salespeople view selling as adversarial. Mm -hmm. You against the prospect trying to win them over, manipulate them, pressure them so you make money. So you have wow. to decide, do you want to be at the top or do you want to just be average? Because that way of thinking is going to get you one or the other. And when you learn the right skills as a collaborative salespeople, the right questioning, the right delivery, the right tonality, it's, it's yeah. really, really simple to make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year selling anything. It doesn't matter yeah. what it is. So going yeah. back, second right. form, and then I'm almost done. Second form. So consultative, more, more persuasive than boiler room. Yep. You're pressuring them, but you're still, like I said, you're starting to play the numbers game because you're bringing out very little emotion when you're asking surface level questions, like logical base. Now, third mode, 
Took forever for us to get here. No, you're good. Third mode, the most, the most persuasive, according to behavioral science, is when we allow others to persuade themselves. Okay, the term I could give you would be called dialogue. It would be the easiest to, to read, dialogue. And that's when we ask what are called neuroemotional persuasion questions. That stands for NEPQ, all right? Now, how do you get somebody to persuade themselves? That's the $10 million question. Yeah. Can you just show up and say, hey, Josh, uh, go ahead and persuade <laughs> yourself and here's our work. No, right? You have to learn, as you know, specific skilled questions when and how to ask them in a step-by-step -step structure that get your prospects to pull you in and wow. sell themselves rather than you trying to push them forward. So much easier to sell at that point. You with me? Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I'm with you. This is, this is phenomenal. All right, what else you got for me? Oh, great. I was going to, I wanted you to expand a little bit even more on that, you know, because I, I think that is so much to unpack and so much to, to dive into. So, um, yeah. but I, that's good. I guess you, you had, there's a question that you have and I, and I want to ask you because I think it's powerful. Yeah. Why do you feel like it's important for someone to have the ability to sell in today's world? Not just a sales pro, but across yeah, the Yeah, I mean, it, well, it's, well, first of all, it's every, everybody's in sales. Now, I mean, it, it doesn't matter what you do, uh, even if you have a job or even if you don't have a job, even if you have a job that you don't even get paid a commission if a sale is made. I call that non-sales selling, all right? So yeah. everybody out there in the world, I don't care if you're a stay-at-home parent, if you're a CFO of a company, if you're a general contractor, if you're a teacher, if you're an attorney, you're still out there every day trying to persuade, you're trying to influence, and you're trying to convince others. You're trying to move people, right? So mm -hmm. I'll give you a few examples. If you're a business owner, you know, think of the, the owners of your company. I think Taylor, I'm not sure what the other owner's name is. You would know. If you're a business owner and you're trying to get your employers to catch the vision of where you're wanting to go with the company, well, what are you doing? You're mm -hmm. trying to persuade, you're trying to influence, and you're trying to move others, right? If you're an employee, on the flip side, and you're trying to convince your boss to give you a pay raise because you're really performing well, what are you doing? You're trying to persuade, you're trying to influence, you're trying to convince, you're trying to move them. If you're a politician trying to get people to vote for you, yeah. we even have congressional right. candidates as clients now, believe it or not, which is crazy. <laughs> you are trying to convince, persuade, and move others. If you're an attorney trying to convince the judge that your client's innocent, what are you trying to do? Persuade, yeah. influence, and move others. So. Everyone is in sales now. It doesn't matter what you do. We're all trying to influence and persuade every single day. So once you learn the right skills with persuasion, you really can go do anything in, in your life, make a ton of money, and be able to change industries at the whim of a dime. It doesn't really matter if you go sell you know, high ticket today and you're like, you know what? I don't want to sell high ticket anymore. I want to sell financial services. And then in a year from here, you're like, I don't like financial services. I want to go sell yachts. And then you're like, I don't like to sell yachts. I want to go sell... Boeing airplanes. It doesn't yeah. matter what yeah. you do. You'll always be at the very top. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I think we even went through, I don't, I don't know how long ago now, but we even to the point where we had our HR learn about sales because yeah. you want all these people who are horrible at SOPs to start doing your SOPs just to, you know, make things function and smooth and operating. It's like, you got to know how to persuade them and influence them that this way is the best way moving forward. Yeah. And everybody's I, I mean, in sales. Everybody's in sales. I mean, even, even these, some of these business owners are just like, well, I'll just hire this team. And I'm like, it doesn't work like that because I'm like, A, you'll never be able to inspect what you expect. And if you can't do that, you're up a creek. And, you know, and B, then it's like you are responsible for communicating the solution that you have to whatever X problem is. And if you don't know how to do that, then I'm sorry, you'll never, you'll never continue. Or there's no sustainability in it. So I, I think it's absolutely brilliant, you know, the way that you're talking about it. What is the biggest um, myth that you see business owners and sales pros believe right now? I think one of the biggest myths we see, so, you know, we even have fortune, you know, we have a fortune 100 client, right? right, right it's right. a search right. engine. You guys have ever heard of a search engine that a lot of people search in. That's the one. I can't say their name. Yeah. <laughs> That's the what happens when you sign deals with companies like that. Yeah. But we train four of their divisions. All right. And so when companies like that bring you in for audits that are already doing, you know, billions of dollars a year, you'll be shocked on how bad their sales process is. 
And I think one of the biggest myths I see so many companies doing, whether it's, you know, a Fortune 500 company to an SMB all the way down to individual salespeople selling anything, yeah. is that salespeople are still being taught, which I'm so shocked. That you need to be re like when you talk to your prospect, you need to show how excited you are about the product and show them how excited you are about all the things that it can do. And I, I know when I when I train companies like that, when I get up on stage, people are like, no, Jeremy, I, I've always been taught like I read this book <laughs> that said that the more excited I am to the prospect that somehow I don't know how, but somehow they're just going to be excited back about what I'm selling. Gosh. And I'm like. Where does the evidence show that, actually? Yeah. I want you to think about yourself. When you go to a car dealership, and, mm -hmm. I, and we train lots of car dealerships, so there's, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go to a car dealership, and the salesperson comes out, and they're really excited that you're there, and they're like, oh, welcome into the dealership today. We're really excited you're here. We've got some great promotions going on. Yeah. Folks, come over here. Let me show you this car. What do you instantly do? Hey, run. <laughs> Just run. Yeah. The wall of resistance goes up, all right? Yeah. We have to get rid of the commission breath. Now, do I mean that you should not be excited about what you sell? No, you should be excited, but you have to keep that internal, mm -hmm. keep it to yourself. Here's one thing we have to understand, Behavioral Science 101, within the first seven to 12 seconds of any sales conversation you're in, I don't care if it's an inbound lead or an outbound lead or a cold call, B2B, B2C, it doesn't matter, your prospects subconsciously, we can't even help it as a human being. We are subconsciously picking up that other person's social cues, their verbal and nonverbal cues based on their tonality. And if we can see them, their body language, what they are saying and or asking that triggers our brain to react, to react in one of two ways. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we get on that call and we come across aggressive, if we come across needy, like we need the sale and everybody yeah. knows what I mean. Yeah, and we yeah. come across attached and we don't know the right questions to ask. It triggers the brain to go into what we call fight or flight mode. Has everybody right. heard that? No. Most people don't understand that that's triggered by us, the salesperson, not the prospect, <laughs> right? We're triggering that by what we're yeah. saying. And that's where the prospect tries to get rid of you quickly. Or even if it's an inbound lead, they're like, hey, I don't have time for this, Josh. Can you just get to the point? Like, what's your packages? How much is it going to cost? See, that's a triggered response, right? Now, if we come across in our conversations more neutral, like we're unbiased, we're not quite sure we can even help yet because we don't know anything about them, right? We don't know the situation. We come across more calm, more collective, and especially deta detached. And we ask the right questions at the right time it triggers the brain to become curious enough where they feel like they want to engage. They want to open up to us and go below the surface because they feel like we might have something important to them. So we as sales professionals have to learn to become detached from really the expectations of making the sale and instead focus on whether or not we can actually solve their problems. Now, mm -hmm. do we know that really any outbound or inbound lead that comes to us has problems? Well, yes, because there's a reason why they responded to the ad. It's like they raised their hand and filled out a form and they're basically saying, help me. They obviously have a problem, otherwise they wouldn't have filled out the damn right, form, right? right so we right, know right, right. that, but we have to keep that to ourselves. So we have to keep that excitement to ourselves because the moment the prospect thinks you are just there to sell them is the moment they do what? They emotionally start to shut down. And even the very best of questions, they're only going to stay surface level with you and they'll never open up to what's really going on. You with me? Yeah. Oh, I'm totally with you. I mean, this is how I'll tell our teams and the different teams that I train. And I'm like, stop, stop selling and start serving people. Like there's, there's no need to, to sell them on something because when somebody actually needs something, I like right now, um, I don't know who said this. I heard this not too long ago. It's like, think about when you have a company and your credit card changes because the expiration date changed. And, you, and yeah. like, are you the first to call them and say, hey, by the way, this changed? Or are they having to beat down your door? When you actually need something and someone can properly show you, hey, I can take you from A to B, you know, I've, they, yeah. because they widen the gap and can help you close it at the same time. It's like, yeah. you're actually yeah. serving somebody. There's, there's yeah. like real human interaction there. Well, you said, you said something that's really key there. You talked about the gap. Okay, yeah. so any sales conversation we're in, 
at the very beginning, we have to find out what their current situation is. Mm -hmm. All right. doesn't matter if it's an inbound or outbound lead or cold calling. doesn't matter. It's all the same. We call that the current state. We also have to help them see and find out what their objectives look like. We call that their objective state. So current state, current mm -hmm. situation, we have to help them and you find out what that is because most prospects don't know in the beginning, okay, until you ask, until you find right. out. We have to find out where they want to be. What does their future look like once all of these problems are solved? Now, what's the gap between where they are and where they want to be? The gap is only determined by the amount of skilled questions you know how to ask that build that gap in their mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you might come into a conversation with an easy laydown sale and the gap's already built by themselves. But if you want to expand that, your questions have to be really good. Most of your prospects come in with a gap like this. Yeah. They know they have a problem, but they don't really know how bad the problem really is. And maybe they don't understand what the consequences are of not doing anything about solving the problem. Now, once you learn the right questions, once you learn how to how to open them up, okay, work with human behavior that gap starts to get really big in their mind. Oh. And now there's so much urgency to do something about it by the gap created from your questions that they basically just sell themselves and are ready to go. And all we have to do is basically ask some commitment questions to get them to take the next step to purchase what you're offering. It makes selling really, really easy. We have to build the gap, not by telling them what their problems are, because that, as you know, is going to go in one ear and out the other. You're the salesperson, you're biased. Right, right. But our questions right. allow them to tell themselves what their real problems are why they have the problems, like the root cause, and how the problems are affecting them. Once you learn that type of questioning skill, not only are you able to help them find one problem, but now you're able to help them see that they have two, three, or four other problems they didn't even really think they had. And when you're able to do that, you know how they start to view you? They view you as the expert or like the trusted authority who's going to get them the results they want, and they will gladly pay you more money to get those results over, over your competitors right. because no other person has ever got them to see that in their mind. Yeah, it's so good, man. It kind of leads me to a question I love to ask people before because I know we're going to wrap it up here soon and I could talk to you for days because you're so chock full of just wisdom and knowledge. But do you, this is kind of like one of these questions that I hear like, you know, sales guys or, you know, guys or gals always asking each other. It's like, well, they just, they weren't closable. You know, they just weren't closable. Do you what does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, but that's my question. Do you believe everyone is closable or or, or or not? You know, yes or no? If so, why? Kind of a thing. Well, I, I mean, it depends. Like, okay, so when I hear that, yeah. what that tells me is that they blame prospects rather than look at their own sales ability, mm -hmm. right? Anybody is closable that can go out and find the funding to purchase what you're offering. Now, if they are homeless, Okay, and they have two dollars to their name, and they've been living on the street for seven years, and you're selling something that's thirty grand. That's yeah. probably not somebody that you can help, right? right? But most of your prospects that you get, it's not like the money doesn't exist. It's not like they're spending. Let, let's say your product is five grand. I'm just throwing out a random number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like they're spending that money. It's it's not like they don't have that money. The money exists. They're just spending it other places because those other things that they're spending on in their mind at this point are more of a priority than spending it with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we have to get the prospect to view in their mind that it is far less risky for them to get the funding together, purchase what we're offering so their problems get solved and they get the, where they want to be than it is for them to do nothing at all, stay in the status quo, their problems stay the same and nothing ever changes, which is more risky, Yeah. right? So all it is, is a transfer of where that money is already being spent that is a priority in their mind. By the end of that call, you're able to help them see that that money is more of a priority to be spent with you, Yeah. okay? So anytime you, as a sales professional, never say the lead is closable or, Oh, my prospects just have fear. They just have a lot of fear. Well, no shit, Sherlock. But it's your <laughs> job as the sales professional to help them overcome that fear. That's why yeah. you get paid a lot of money. That's your job to help them overcome the fear. Yeah, I, I love it. My favorite thing that I've ever learned from Taylor was actually when he said, power comes from self-honesty. And the day that I saw, like when I was, you know, you know just pounding the phones, I saw, yeah. you know, exponential growth is when I stopped doing this 
and and then pointing the finger. And I looked back at myself and I was like, and and if they didn't close at the end of the car, whatever the case might be, I would start asking myself, what did you miss, Josh? How did you exactly. not help them? How did you not serve them? Where, you know, some questions, you know, what what tie down did I miss and things of that from yeah. tactical. But yeah. I, I made sure it was about me because the yeah. second that I started putting in there, now it's like, well, and then it could also be this prospect and this prospect and this prospect. And it's like, now we're never actually dealing with the freaking real root issue. And I'm only trying to address symptoms instead of the root problem. Once you look at yourself and your own sales ability, like he said, self-honesty is where you grow. Mm -hmm. You'll never grow unless you do that. So yeah. when you're a salesperson, if you miss a sale, instead of blaming them, be like, what did I not ask them? Like, what am I missing? Because if you go into every call thinking that when they don't buy, it's a prospect's fault, mm -hmm. you're really, you're really going to struggle as a salesperson. Oh yeah. When you start sure. looking at your own responsibility, that's where you want to learn more advanced sales because what's gotten you here is never going to get you here, mm -hmm. right? If you're already making six or eight or 10 grand a month in commissions and you keep doing the same things, keep saying the same things, keep asking the same question, how are you going to start making 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 grand a month in commissions doing the same thing? You can't. Uh, so if you want to get to a higher level, you do what? You have to learn more advanced skills. Yeah. That's it. You got to increase your capacity. It's either that That's or right. decrease your goals. And well, no one's successful has ever decreased their goals. So it's like <laughs> you got to increase your capacity. Uh, Jeremy, again, I don't know how to thank you a million times uh, over. I'm just so grateful for the wisdom you literally I mean, guys, if you didn't learn something from here, I would highly suggest you change professions. And, um, you know, I, I hear Starbucks is hiring because this was pure gold nuggets that will allow you um, to really transform your current situation, uh, whoever you're selling for in, in any yeah. situation. So absolutely epic. Yeah, and and I, thank you. Yeah. And it's just asking, you, you know, like we were talking about, you know, change and getting them to view that it's far more risky to do nothing at all. So, you know, one one good type of questions that you really, that everybody has to learn are, are what we call consequence questions, okay? Where you're basically asking them, uh, you're asking them a consequence question that causes them to see the consequences of what happens if they don't do anything about the solving the problem. So yeah. let's, uh, I'm trying to give you an example. I was just, I was working on yeah. this script right before yeah. I got on here with a company that sells like leads to, to companies that sell, right? To sell anything. They sell yeah. higher quality leads, right? A higher avatar. So a consequence question might, might be something like this. Okay, but what happens if you guys don't do anything about this and you keep yeah. getting these lower quality leads, like you mentioned, and your sales keep stagnating another three, six, even 12 months around? Like what happens then? Yeah. yeah. See, that's a consequence question, all right? That gets them to think like, oh shit, what happens if nothing happens, basically? Mm -hmm. So it helps build urgency for them to do something now, not push it down the road. Oh. Well, okay, but why look at, like a business owner? Okay, but why look at doing something like this now? Why not just push it down the road like unsuccessful business owners would? Mm -hmm. It's hard for them to come back and say, because they don't want to be in that category of unsuccessful business owners. Yeah, okay, yeah, but yeah. why look at changing this now? Like, why not push it down the road like unsuccessful business owners would? Well, oh. the reason why we have to do it now is because of, and see, now they're pulling you in and telling you and more importantly themselves why they have to do it now. Yeah. You got it? Yeah. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. Jeremy, where would you love, like, you know, someone's listening to us because uh, obviously we have a very large platform and all these people are going to be listening. If someone, sure. what's your favorite place to send people to, to engage with you right now? Yeah. If they, you know, if they want some resources where they can sell more, uh, the best place to go is our private Facebook group. We got about 18,000 or so people in there. We started about a year ago. It's called, you just go to www.salesrevolution.pro. So just go to salesrevolution.pro. And right when you join, check your, your Facebook messages. Somebody on my team will message you over a free training called the NEPQ 101 mini course. It has a bunch of different questions for different sales situations you guys can use. That alone will probably help you sell more than what you are now. Yeah. And we typically go live in that Facebook group, I'd say at least three times a week with different Q&As, different trains. In fact, today I'm doing an advanced training on like advanced probing questions for 30 mm. minutes. So we go live in their Facebook training, just different trainings on selling skills for different situations. And they're welcome to join that if they want to learn how to sell more. On on the ones where this will be a uh, video, we'll also put that in the comments as well, like sure. YouTube and stuff like that. So that way yeah. you guys can, you know, even have a quick act, 
uh, access link to it. So um, if this has in any way uh, helped you revolutionize the way that you're thinking about what you're currently doing in sales or in any way, um, would you guys share it? That is the most powerful thing that you can do is to help someone else in the same thing that you just got helped with. Okay. So if you, if you like it, obviously all the likes, comments, all the bells and all that crap, um, we're grateful for it. We love it. You know, we couldn't be happier, um, that we're able to serve y'all and help y'all, but again, make sure that you share it like this, Jeremy, you're an absolute legend. Uh, we'll make sure we push people towards you and, and we're just super grateful for you today. Thank you so much. Hey, you guys, man. I appreciate it. My, my kids always say I'm boring. So thanks for the compliment. Nah, you're a legend. <laughs> you're a legend. You're a legend. So, all right. Till next time, guys, we're out.